Imagine it's summer. You're hanging out by the pool, having a good time. Peer over your sunglasses. Is that kid all right? Oh my God, call 911, call 911. You jump in the pool, you fish a kid out of the water, and the next thing you hear, 911, what is the location of your emergency? Did you know that last year there were 240 million 911 calls made in the U.S.? With a cell phone sitting in just about everybody's pocket, I'm sure that you've called 911. And if you haven't, you know somebody who has. I've been working with 911 dispatchers for the past five years, and I can tell you, and I've been in a lot of call centers, there is no other call that is more intense and more constrained than a call to 911. Time is of the essence. And dispatchers' number one resource for helping you is how they understand the way language works. Now, dispatchers and I have a lot in common. You see, they deal with communication problems all day long. And I'm a conversation analyst. I analyze communication problems. I use a scientific method called conversation analysis. It studies conversation, talk, in its most natural setting. Talk between people doing real things. I analyze the linguistic choices people make when they call 911 or when they call a friend to ask for help. I'm also interested in things like how you get activity started. So how is this dispatcher going to instruct this caller on how to give CPR to a drowning child? Now, when I work with dispatch supervisors, we talk about these calls. We analyze these calls. We come up with best practices for getting people through these calls. And we look at language and how language works. And today, I'm going to share with you two lessons we can learn from dispatchers about how to use language in our own lives to make things better. The first lesson we're going to talk about is on word choice, turn design, and how you could redesign an action to redirect somebody's attention. The second lesson we're going to learn is about, it's not just what you say and how you say it, but think about when you ask a question as a strategy for getting different outcomes. Lesson number one. How many of you ever talked to someone who was having a really bad day? Dispatchers do this all day long. Now, how many of you had to get information out of that person having a really bad day? Dispatchers have to do that too. When somebody calls 911, they don't automatically know where you are. You have to tell them your exact location. So after you tell them your exact location, you then tell them the problem of what happened. Now, if you call about an accident or medical emergency, dispatchers are going to ask you a series of questions about the ill or injured. A lot of the questions they ask are going to be in a yes-no format. Because yes-no format is a very quick and efficient way to get information. And when time is of the essence, you need to do it fast. And for the most part, this works pretty well. Now, there are two key questions dispatchers need to ask especially if you're dealing with somebody who's having a medical problem or if they're injured. And that is, are they conscious and are they breathing? Yes, no questions. And they work remarkably well. In this case, the dispatcher asks the caller, is she conscious? The caller hears and understands the question and in the immediate next turn, she responds. Then, you see the caller accepts that response, is adequate, sufficient, okay, immediately asks the next, and again, the caller responds. Quick, simple, and efficient. The problem is, yes, no questions don't always get such straightforward responses. Sometimes they get things like, I don't know, maybe. Sometimes they don't get a response at all because the caller is now distracted by the person in crisis. What do they do? Well. In this next call, the caller phones because she's worried about her next door neighbor, thought she might be suicidal and is going to hurt herself. 
In that kind of question, a dispatcher needs to know if the person's being violent because they could possibly harm themselves, they could possibly harm the caller, and they could possibly harm the first responding team. So we ask, is the person violent? If somebody is distracted by the person in crisis, they're not going to respond immediately. And now this sets up a different kind of communication problem for dispatchers. How am I going to get their attention? What am I going to do to get them back? Now you could pause for a minute and think, well, what would I do? I'd probably say something like, hello? Or you might say, can you hear me now? Or maybe you would do what this dispatcher did and just say, ma'am. And it works. But getting somebody's attention is different than engaging somebody as a cooperative partner for patient care. And that's what dispatchers need. When you call 911, dispatchers need you. You are the eyes and ears on the ground. You have to do the work. You need their attention. No, you need their cooperation. We see in this case, there's evidence that dispatcher treats the attention as not enough, and in the next turn, pleads with the caller, pay attention to me, and the caller answers the question. But you can already see a comparison between the first set of cases I showed you and this. There's a delay. A delay in responses delays the provision of help. So what do dispatchers do? What is the strategy? Well, I, I listen to a lot of 911 calls, and we all know that the opioid crisis is a national problem, national epidemic. Dispatchers get a number of these calls a day. And when a person is calling because of a drug overdose, chances are they're not conscious. They're probably not breathing well. And they have to ask a question if they're changing color. Another yes, no question. But when I was analyzing these calls, I found it really striking when callers phone because somebody is overdosing, they're crying, they're upset. This is a very traumatizing find if you're a caller. And dispatchers need to get that person through that emotional hurdle. Is she changing color? In the call that I'm gonna share with you now, this caller was really upset, found a friend who had a needle sticking out of her arm. Oh my God, she's dead, she's dead, oh my God. Yes, no questions going unanswered. Caller's crying. Dispatcher needs a different strategy. He redesigns his question, changes the course of action. Okay, can you see her? Now, you're probably thinking this is not the same question. No, it's an alert. It alerts the caller that I'm going to engage you in doing something. When callers phone 911, especially any kind of emergency, overdose, medical, car accident, they always say the same thing. Tell me what to do, tell me what to do. This dispatcher is going to tell her what to do. He gives her a menu. Is she blue? Is she white? Is she pale? Something to choose from, something specific, something she can respond to. And what was so striking about this call, the caller, without hesitation, although had not really been paying attention, responds back immediately, great. That's actually good news. So what's the lesson here? Redesign the question redirect the action. If you ever have been a camp counselor, teacher, parents, babysitter, and a kid falls, skins their knee, you know how painful that is. They start to cry, and you're like, calm down, calm down. Calm down doesn't always work. Redirect their attention. Say, can you show me? Can you point to where it hurts? And maybe you can't get them to cry, stop crying rather but you can get them to show you. You engage them as a co-participant in their care. And what I found with calls like this, what that ends up doing, it calms the callers down because they hear and feel that help is on the way and it restores hope. Lesson number two. I started my program on public safety about five years ago and I started working with universities and in their university police departments. They asked me to look at a call called check wellness call. I don't know if you've heard of this. This is a call where somebody would phone in, a parent, a friend, I haven't heard from them in a while, I'd like to check on their well-being. Universities like Northeastern probably get about three of these calls a week. And so the dispatch center wanted me to look at these calls. They felt like 
we could do a better job. Well, the key question in this is, what is your concern? Now I know, now that you've analyzed some calls, you're probably thinking, I'd like to examine the, the turn design of that. This is a question that gets at the mental health or physical well-being of somebody. What is your concern? But remarkably, callers do understand this question when it's positioned correctly in the conversation. And what we found is that when it's positioned early, callers really don't understand what the dispatchers were trying to ask. This example comes from a call where a mother phoned because she hadn't heard from her daughter in a while. She gives this very long account. She's really worried, hasn't heard from her. Dispatcher asks the right question, priority question, okay, is there a reason why you're concerned? It's a little cringeworthy there, isn't it? You're asking a mother why she's concerned about the well-being of her child? Mm. Now, in this case, the caller downgrades her concern. I, I just haven't heard from her. Other callers are not so nice. They're like, what? What are you talking about? It's my kid. I'm worried. And it created some problems. In contrast, we found that when dispatchers would ask the caller later, as part of the line of questioning, when was the last time you heard from them? When was the last time? What would they be doing about now? Callers would respond and then hear and understand the wellness question as seeking additional information on the well-being of the person they're calling about. And then the callers would respond and respond and give more. And what was happening here is not only would callers elaborate and give enough detail to understand what was going on with the person that they're calling about. He's having trouble with grades. She just got out of the hospital. I need to make sure she's taking some medication. It created a more natural slot for the questions dispatchers really needed to ask. Are there any medical or psychiatric issues without it sounding accusatory or out of the blue? When can you use this technique? How many of you ever call customer service with a complaint? <laughs> so oftentimes, if you start customer service calls with a complaint, they can just ignore that. When you end the call with a complaint, if your question is not answered to your satisfaction, you'll have different leverage on that customer service agent. And you can tell them, I told you to do that. <laughs> When I tell people I analyze conversations for a living, they go, ah, oh, that's so messy and organized. But it's not. Talk is systematic and orderly. And we can learn a lot from dispatchers about how talk works. In the US, you might find it surprising, dispatchers are classified as clerks. But they're not. And there is a movement to reclassify them as protective service workers. They are the people sitting on the tip of the spear. They are the first first responders. Without them, nobody would know there was an emergency. I'll tell you one more story from the dispatch center because a lot of, a lot of people like to hear question, you know, stories. And if after you hear this story, you think they are protective service workers, I encourage you to call senators and say you need to change their classification. Last year in the UK, a guy was walking a dog comes across a guy who is completely dead. At least he thought he was dead. He poked him, he said he was pale, he was stiff. This guy was certainly not alive. The dispatcher, using the technique of redesigning the question to redirect the action, said to the man, can you see if you can maybe start CPR until the paramedics arrive? Maybe we can revive him that way. The caller did it. The man lived. Dispatchers save lives. When you are at your worst, they have to be at their best. And they could really teach us just how powerful talk can be. Thank you.